Welcome to our East End Women in Business program. My name is Frances Kathleen Dice, President of the Houston East End Chamber, and it's an honor to welcome you to our virtual program. It is no secret that during COVID-19, many women-owned businesses had a lot of setbacks. Many businesses, like the ones that you're going to hear today, worked extra hard to keep their doors open and thrive. I know that you're going to leave today being motivated, inspired, and you'll also, they'll also show you how you, like them, can reach the success that you all deserve. Yes, we are having a virtual program, but this is an opportunity for us to partner with Houston Media Source. They're here in the East End on Harrisburg Boulevard, and right behind me is the control room. Our staff, their staff, is working together to make sure that this program is on our website, on their website, on Channel 17 Comcast, and on Channel 99 UVerse. You too can use this facility for your corporate or personal programming. Make sure to contact Gina here at Houston Media Source. Today would not be possible without our sponsors, and I wanted to thank Liz Lara Carreño of Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses. Under her leadership, the program is a great resource for business owners and for the city of Houston. Make sure that you participate in this program, and if you want more information, our website has our email address. Thank you very much, Liz. We wouldn't be here today without our silver sponsors, and I wanted to make sure that we said thank you to them. We have Centerpoint Energy, West Gulf Maritime Association, Wolf & Company Gulfgate Mall, Gulf Winds International, TPC Group, Houston Community College Southeast, and Logical Innovations, Inc., who is one of our speakers today. Thank you very much, Denise. Five of the seven silver sponsors today have women presidents or CEOs running those companies, and I think that that is a beautiful thing. We are also grateful to our individual sponsors. You will see their names on the screen, but I wanted to say a special thank you to Lucia Garcia of Alpine Services, a women-owned business who is our newest member of the Chamber. If you would like information about joining the Chamber and continuing programmings like this, please give me a call at the Chamber. My email address is also on the website. Thank you, Lucia, and we look forward to working with you. Before I introduce our moderator, I wanted to thank someone very special, Rachel Savalos. She owns Identity Plus, and she helped us create these mugs today with our logo on the front, and then their logo is on the back. Identity Plus is a promotional company that prints a little bit of everything. They're based here in the East End. It's woman-owned, and she is open for business. Also, you'll see in flower arrangements on the, the desks when the program starts, those were produced by Sharonda Scroggins, of owner of KC Events and Florals, another women-owned business and who is open for business. If you want to send yourself flowers for Valentine's Day or any day, please make sure that you use a women-owned business like Sharonda's. And now it is my honor to introduce you to our moderator, Denise Hamilton. Denise is founder and CEO of Watch Her Work, a digital learning platform for women and she is highly requested to speak everywhere, and we are so grateful and honored to have her be our moderator today. We started this East End Women in Business three years ago, and she has been our moderator every year. So I keep telling her, before she goes off to New York and become bigger and better things, we're so honored and grateful that she comes back <coughs> and gives back to us and moderates this wonderful program. So you're in for a treat. I'm going to turn it over to Denise. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be hosting this event today because it is one of my favorite events I do every year because I love the stories of women, women that have 
beaten the barriers, that have climbed the mountain, women that have done the things that we only dream of, and we get to hear the whole story from their own mouths. I'm so excited. I'm so glad to be here with you today. And um, I'm let's just jump right in because we have these amazing mm. women and we want to hear from them more than you want to hear from me. I'm going to start with our first speaker, Paula Mendoza. She is president and CEO of Possible Missions, Inc. Native Houstonian Paula Mendoza is an entrepreneur, innovator, advocate, barrier breaker, and tireless volunteer, recognized not only for the quality of her work, but for the passion she brings to every endeavor. Under her leadership, Possible Missions, Inc., a company she established in 2001, specializing in procurement solutions, has experienced exponential growth, beginning with $100 in the bank to achieving over $70 million in revenues. Whew. <laughs> the business has achieved significant accolades. Most recently, Mendoza has been named the most admired CEO and executive of the year by the Houston Business Journal and earned the Hispanic Hero Award, Award by Comcast. She has been named one of the top 30 most influential women, a woman of distinction, and a woman on the move. Under Mendoza's leadership, Possible Missions, Inc. was awarded the U.S. SBA 8A Graduate of the Year, Houston Minority Business Council's Supplier of the Year Award, and a Minority Business Enterprise Accountability Award for its expenditures with fellow MBEs, which I love because it means <coughs> not only does she bring in business, but she shares her gifts with people all around her, other businesses. She also has received the U.S. Small Business Administrators Award of Excellence and the UT Alliance Hub Contractor of the Year. And that's just to name a few. I know you're as excited as I am. Let's hear from Paula. Paula? Thanks, Denise. I appreciate being here. And Francis and the Chamber, thank you for allowing me to have the opportunity to share my story. Um, this month, actually, we're celebrating our 20-year anniversary uh, for our company, and it's a huge accomplishment. Unfortunately, we can't celebrate like we would like to because of the situation that we're in with the pandemic, but I think it just brings a lot of things together. And just to share a little bit of my history, because I know we don't all start in this corporate world or as a, as a successful entrepreneur. I mean, I'll take you back just real quick. You know, I didn't think education was important when I uh, got out of high school and so it kind of took me a while and took me about 10 years to get my bachelor's degree which should have been done in three or four um, while I was working two jobs got married at the same time had an instant family and you know as most of us probably living paycheck to paycheck about 30 years ago and so I looked to the future I didn't think I was going to be an entrepreneur but um, fast forward a little bit further down the road of having great mentors in my life. Um, I uh, was positioned greatly by a mentor to have a fabulous corporate job, traveling across the country, helping minority businesses bid with this major company across the United States. And I, and I bring that up because I think it's still the passion I have today and, and in my company. But when I found out the national company wasn't as sincere about bringing these small businesses together to bid, I thought I'm putting my reputation on the line and do I really want to keep doing this? Because once you make relationships and establish these uh, relationships all over the country, those you want to keep and you want to keep your reputation intact, right? So I thought, I think I'm going to do this. I can do it on my own. And so that's what I did. But it, you know, for those of you that uh, know, we all don't do it alone. So have this great job in my family uh, corporate jobs are not easy to come by or really not heard of. I mean, we don't go to college very much. We don't have these big corporate nice jobs. So I thought, okay, I need to go tell my parents that I'm about to quit this great corporate job I have. So I sat my parents down real quick and said, mom and dad, I know y'all think so proud of me for this big job, but I'm going to quit. <laughs> and both my parents' faces just, I mean, immediately went blank. About 30 seconds later, they said, you know what, Miha? If you think you can do this, we support you. So then I turned to my husband, being raised by a very strong Latina woman to be independent and to you know, share my part of the expenses. I looked at my husband and said, I can do this. I think I can do this. And if it doesn't happen in six months, uh, we'll get back, <laughs> I'll get back to a real job. <laughs> and he said, uh, I support you. So fast forward, right? I started my company helping construction contractors 
consulting. So that took me in a different direction, right? This is about 20 some odd years ago, so I'm younger, I'm Hispanic, and I'm a female in the construction industry trying to tell these contractors how to do their work. That didn't go very well at the beginning. Hmm. But I showed them what I can do. That turned into bigger projects, partnering, which is very important for small businesses to partner with others that do business with you and will do business with you and support you. Projects turned, small talk projects turned into large projects and it really just morphed from there. But one of the things that I think is most important is that we don't do it alone. I think you'll find that in this panel today is that we're gonna talk about, it's not just me, I may own the company, but it's not just me. We have mentors, relationships are key. The chamber, the Eastern Chamber, if you don't come and network, if you don't put something into it, you're not gonna get anything out of it. That's where you establish those support mechanisms for you when you're running a company. Networking, doing work in the community, establishing a real solid foundation in relationships is key to you having a successful business. So I think that's key in how I've been able to grow my business. Um, partnering is the other. And you know, fast forward to 20 years later, which I'm so grateful for and can't believe that now I'm looking at 20 years of business, not only one company, but two successful companies. I'm embarking as we speak today on buying a building so that I can expand some of our capabilities and what we're doing. But I, you know, I know we all know this on this panel. It doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of sleepless nights. Um, we're probably all workaholics, but you have to manage that with your family life, your business life, and then what's important. So time management is key. Mentors, I've mentioned it, we probably all have them here at, at this table in this panel, but remember that when you're building your company, when you're building your foundation, that I think that's what's key, is having that support mechanism behind you. And I'll leave you with this, Denise, is I think for those of you ladies that want to start a company or want to grow your company or pivot, as we're saying these days, believe in yourself, that's important. Plan, that's huge. And then just go out and make it happen. Thanks, Denise. Wow. <laughs> what an amazing story. I promise you that this is going to be a fantastic event, and we're off to an amazing start. So let's get to our next incredible speaker. Becky Chen is the owner-operator of Chick-fil-A at the 45 and Wayside location. Um, Becky was born to a family of immigrant parents and grandparents. She grew up in a modest part of Houston, surrounded by faith, laughter, hope, and hard work. From childhood, Becky was brought up in the business, and her parents strove to build successful enterprises out of their mom and pop businesses. Little did she know that this time would instill entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship deep inside of her. Becky believes that her best days end with sore feet and a full <laughs> heart. Her goal as an operator is to make sure that her team has the support, confidence, and grace to achieve great things together. Join me in welcoming Becky Chin. Thank you, Denise. I am pleased to be here. Thank you, Francis, for inviting me. Um, I am very much a Houstonian, uh, born and bred, raised. Um, everything I've done has been in Houston. I'm very proud about that. Um, I went to school here uh, in the East End, and I went to the University of Houston for my college degree. And so I've just loved the thought of my whole life being around Houston. Um, I went really when I went to college, I had no aspirations except to help my family's business. So my major turned into an accounting major just to help them grow. And what I found out of that was um, that I actually liked accounting. Uh, and so I did that for a while. I was, so I was 15 years in, about 10 years in accounting. And from that, um, turned into finance jobs and also got into IT and just kind of expanded my experience. And so it's been, it's been a great road, a lot of experience in different industries, and so that has been helpful. And so when I think about people who don't know what they, young people especially, who don't really know what they want to do, I think the important thing to remember is there's no wasted opportunity if you make the most of it. And so every job that I had led me to what I'm doing now. And so don't waste those opportunities, I, I will say. Um, so just through those experiences, actually divinely, I had the opportunity to come into Chick-fil-A, which is a 
something I never really understood. I didn't know about, I didn't know about Chick-fil-A when I first came. Um, we were not a family that ate out. Uh, we were a very modest income family, so cooking at home was just a natural thing. And just through the different interactions I had throughout my young career, I was able to reconnect with an old colleague and the opportunity was presented to me to start a brand new industry, the restaurant industry, where I had no food service experience. And so just the, the challenge and the adventure of something brand new, that's very invigorating, but it's also very scary. Um, so I started in Chick-fil-A um, in 2004 and became the first Chinese American female operator in the entire chain, so I'm very proud of that. And we are a small but mighty community of female operators. I think we run around 10%, uh, 250 female operators in the chain. And we're, we're growing uh, in, in, in numbers every day. So I'm very proud about that as well. I, I began my operator journey in San Antonio and was there for four and a half years and just began to love serving and hospitality. That's the reason why I came to Chick-fil-A. The idea that I could do both um, impact on young people and that I could serve great food and, and provide great hospitality and people feeling refreshed and respected and loved and cared for, that was a great thing for me. And so when I, when I uh, was able to come back to Houston in 2012, that was quite a joy for me because coming back to Houston was a great thing. But also the, the additional pleasure and surprise of being able to come back to the East End. What, what a win for me. Uh, truly, that was home. And so I, I feel like I've, I've really put myself into a really rooted um, opportunity with being in the East End. Um, and, and as was mentioned, just being a part of the community meant being a part of every part of the community, not just my own business. But being a part of the chamber has, has opened my eyes to lots of opportunities to be able to give back, to be able to network, to help other businesses and colleagues like these ladies here. Um, but most especially for me, my passion is education. And so our store has been able to make impact in education on the East End. And so, you know, one of our goals is to be able to provide um, over $50,000 a year uh, in education at the very least. And so we're, we're well on track to doing that. So I'm proud about that. Uh, and Chick-fil-A has been a great platform that allowed me to do the things that I want to do, make an impact on the next generation. The young people that work for me, I, um, are like my own kids. I'm single, I don't have children, but the 80, mm -hmm. 85 to 90 people that work in my restaurant are all my family, they're my children. Mm -hmm. And so to know that I have an impact in, in creating career opportunities, uh, uh, birthing educational dreams, uh, that's, that really fuels my fire every day. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share my story and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, wow. Well. She said thank you to us for having her. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we just never get tired of hearing these amazing stories from these women who are starting from the beginning. And we're gonna talk, we're gonna get into the questions and answers later to talk about their journeys, but I hope you're paying attention because these stories are amazing, but they're only amazing if you listen and you apply the lessons. All right, we're gonna move to our next speaker, Kelly Taylor. Kelly is CEO of Taylor Construction Management. As founding partner and chief executive officer, Kelly Taylor oversees strategic growth projections for TCM. Her executive oversight spans accounting, administration, staff development, legal, and marketing for the firm. Taylor obtained an undergraduate degree in political science from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, an MBA from Prairie View A&M University, and the professional in human resources PHR certification. She now uses this intensive range of specialties and practical experience to carry out TCM's local project management expertise on a global scale. Her vision has enabled TCM to provide project management leadership to private firms in China since its exception. This leadership was also extended previously to firms in Vietnam and Germany. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Kelly Taylor. Good morning and thank you, Denise. I appreciate that intro that you gave. As Denise mentioned, I am Kelly Taylor. I am the co-founder of Taylor Construction Management. We are approaching our 10 year anniversary next month, so we are excited about that. 
and I co-founded TCM with my husband, Troy Taylor. We decided to, we talked about going into project management for about, going into business actually for about three years prior to actually doing so. And during that time, we came up with every idea, every reason why we should not go into business. We identified every obstacle that we felt was stacked against us. And then one day I was sitting at work and this happened often. And my husband called and he was venting about a project he had just completed and um, was not getting any notoriety or credit for it rather. Someone else was taking full credit for it because he was working for another firm. And at that point, I literally stopped what I was doing. I, to this day, I have no idea what um, emboldened me so that I would stop working and actually go online and start a business at that point. And so that's really how TCM uh, was birthed. And what I realized though, is that once we got the ball rolling, none of those things that we identified as obstacles meant anything to us. We, we, we strategized and we believed wholeheartedly in what we were starting to do. And so we both had a 10, uh, we both had a, a six figure job at that time. And so to leave our jobs, we had children, we had a mortgage and to, to leave and walk away from that security and, and go into entrepreneurship was definitely a pivotal point for us. It, it tested our faith in ourselves and our trust in, in each other and what we were embarking on. And what I decided was that I would continue my day job and, until the, the, the business started to generate income. And so keep in mind that TCM had two employees to start. That was Troy and Kelly. <laughs> and so I was going to keep my day job and he was going to work the projects. And what I did not realize is that our first project would be in Lanzhou, which is in the uh, Gansu province in China. So that, that, that brought about a whole nother discussion. How do we make this work? And so what happened was I continued to work on the infrastructure of the business. Troy would go to China for two weeks and then come home for two weeks. During that time, I was a mom, I was teacher, I was a, a homemaker, caretaker, all of that, and an entrepreneur and an employee. And so the difficulty with that was that I would have to stay up overnight uh, because it was about 12 to 13 hour differences in time and he needed an opportunity to download. So I would stay up to midnight to talk to him during uh, his lunch break, get up, take the kids to school, do my day job, pick the kids up, do homework, feed them, get a little bit of rest and do the same thing over. And I point that out to say that I feel like I'm at a point now where anyone watching me from the outside may think that it, it looks easy or that it's glitz and glam and it's not. There's a lot of hard work that goes into building a company, a lot of hard work that goes into maintaining the core, your core values. Mm -hmm. Being an entrepreneur can strip you of that if you are focused on just building a company and not maintaining a moral compass. I, uh, one of the other things that I, I wanted to point out that's very important to me is community. It's, it's extremely important to me that I stay connected to my community, that I give back. I'm in my happy place when I'm talking to young women in underserved communities, sharing my story with them, sharing with them that I'm not much different from you. I'm not much different from you at all. I was born to young parents. I am originally from rural Arkansas, grew up with meager means. And so I like to share that because I, I personally know the importance of having someone who looks like you share the honesty of their story. It provides for you a safe place to ask questions and to be vulnerable. And it gives you something to aspire to. Education is also extremely important to me. So in 2019, we started a $100,000 endowed scholarship at Prairie View A&M University. And the plan is to do the same thing at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And the, and the, the, the idea behind that is that we don't want, as, as much as possible, we don't want people to graduate with a mound of, of uh, student loan debt. So if we can make a small dent in that, then that's what we are here to do.
And so I'll conclude that uh, here's what you need to know about me is that I believe there's a God with my interest at the top of his mind. Mm -hmm. I believe character and hard, diligent work are the ingredients to success. I still dream big and I'm convinced that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And so my gift, your gift, all of our gifts will make room for themselves. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Denise, for having me. Amen. <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> you, if you know me at all, you know I'm excited because I love hearing these stories. And I love the commitment that these beautiful women have of sowing into future generations to make sure that we all fulfill the gifts and the talents that have been placed within us. So I am loving every minute of this. And last but definitely not least is Denise Navarro, who is president and CEO of Logical Innovations, Inc. Denise Navarro is the president and CEO of Logical Innovations, Inc., a minority-owned small business honored as NASA agency-level small business prime co contractor of the year for fiscal year 2019. Logical Innovations has provided technical, business, and creative services for the federal government since 2006. Logical Innovations is headquartered in Houston, Texas, with operations in Alabama, California, Florida, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, Nevada, New Mexico, Ohio, Texas, and Washington, D.C. <laughs> I know you are waiting, you are ready to hear from our next speaker, Denise Navarro. Thank you, Denise, and thank you, East End and uh, Francis, for allowing me to be here with these amazing women. And I, I'm listening to their stories going, oh my gosh, I have to follow all of that. <laughs> but what's interesting is there's a piece of my story in each of their stories. Um, yeah, as Denise mentioned, um, I started Logical Innovations in 2006, but actually I started it in 1999 is when we incorporated um, because I'm ever the planner, ever the make sure I have my ducks in a row and I'm ready when I hit the ground running. It took me seven years to really make sure I was ready and I was ready to, to take that ultimate risk. Um, you know, Kelly mentioned about, you know, working full time, but still trying to get something going. So that's what I had logical innovations on the shelf and I was doing a little care and feeding, doing a little side job just to keep it growing and, and going along. Um, you know, there's so many factors to what brings us here. Um, education is very key. Um, I was very blessed to, to have a, a strong family support unit that encouraged us. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm the youngest of three girls. So in a Latina family and our culture, you know, does it say, oh, women, of course, are going to go to college. Mm -hmm. But my parents, um, they insisted. We knew nothing else. We were going to school. So ever the multitasker, I decided I could I could have a family. I could work all day and I could go to school all night because I could do it all. Right. So uh, so I was the non-traditional student. Um, I didn't know that wasn't a thing, <laughs> but, but um, so, so I did all of these things in conjunction with each other. And I started off um, because, you know, I, I was a nerd when nerds weren't cool. So I, I, was, the, I was the techie and I wanted to go and, and pursue a degree in computer science. And, and so I started off at College of the Mainland in Texas City. Um, I'm, a, I'm a product of minority serving institutions. And I started at College of the Mainland and you know, got a degree there, took a little bit of business classes, and I thought, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> Went on to University of Houston, Clear Lake to get my bachelor's in computer information systems. I was working, um, I actually was very fortunate to start a job at NASA Johnson Space Center during that time, mm -hmm. so I could easily go to work, go down the road, and go to class all night. And, and so I, I, I got my degree in computer information systems, but as I'm working along in this technical path, I just had this aha moment that said, I really, I'm enjoying what I'm doing and building software and, and um, you know, resolving issues, but I really, really like people. And as you're gonna be able to tell, I really like to talk. So I really like engaging with others. So I took the management path on my, for my career. And so I went back to school and I said, well, I think I'm gonna go get my MBA now. So, so I did that and, 
and then along the way, I, you know, I was working for other companies. I was working for small businesses and I was really getting bit by that bug saying, I can do this. I know I can do this. I can, I can take the good lessons and, you know, make sure I, I store those away. I can look at the bad lessons and go, yeah, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> and, and, and that's how I, I really started developing this company. Um, so I, I had the opportunity um, to go work for a company that was based in Northern Virginia. And so the first time when I was recruited, um, you know, the first thing I said, well, I'm, I'm a girl from Texas. I am not leaving Texas. But if you figure out a way to let me live in Texas, I'll be there every week. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I said, and, you know, if you've ever spent some time on the Beltway, you can spend <laughs> less time in the air flying there than you can driving. So, so, uh, so I got that that opportunity to work with a company based in Northern Virginia. But I was very, very honest, and I said, I have a company called Logical Innovations, and this is my ultimate goal. And I have to tell you that I'm um, I'm embarking on this career in Northern Virginia. Um, you know, I've got family going, you're doing what? I was like, trust me, trust me. It's going to be fine. <laughs> but, you know, I let them know. I said, you are my last stop on my way to really taking this, this company um, out and public and ready to go. And, um, and they said, fantastic. Stay with us a few years. Um, help us grow our business. And then we will be your first customer. So... We talk about establishing our network and the importance of mentors. Yep. Yep. And I, I couldn't have, you know, a better group of people, you know, surrounding me. But this company gave me the opportunity to walk out. And it was actually October 31st, 2006. I walked out of my, the building um, my last day as an employee. And I walked back in the next day and I had a signed subcontract. So my first, the first work was in Greenbelt, Maryland. And who'd have thought, you know, this, this girl born in Galveston and living in Galveston County all her life, you know, has these opportunities. And so I thought, I've got to make the most of it. I've got to, you know, this has got to work. And I had an opportunity, one task order that really was just me working. So party of one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I said, but it's up to me to get out there, to market it, to get to know the people. So, you know, every, all of us talk about this network. You have to establish this network of people because it's all about people. We don't stand alone. There's no such thing as a self-made person. Um, I, I'm very fortunate that I surround myself with wonderful people. Um, and, you know, one of the coolest things about um, as Logical Innovations has progressed, and you saw a picture of two young, beautiful people standing around me. Those are my children my adult children um, who are working with me and my executive leadership. And, it, and it's wonderful. Um, they also, the same path, College of the Mainland, University of Houston, Clear Lake, but they followed their own interests. So they have very different interests than I do. Um, but their skills and their experiences and their talents um, we're utilizing very effectively in the company. And so it's really cool to be able to, you know, be you know, with your children by your side and build this company. Um, so, so, you know, and they've been with me since the beginning and watching me, you know, pull my hair out and, and you know, <laughs> the first proposal where it's spread all over the, the, the kitchen table, like, okay, you punch holes, you throw the binders <laughs> together, we're gonna do this. Um, so, you know, fast forward and, um, you know, we're here and almost 15 years later, um, so 2020, November 1st, 2021 will be 15 years fully operational when we, 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 you know, embarked on this and it's just gone by so fast and it's so exciting. And, um, you know, I, you know, one of the things I always look at, you know, in not being alone on an island, doing this all by myself, having these people, um, we've got just amazing employees. And, you know, when I hear people read my bio and I hear we're all over the country, I, th I think, oh, is that me? Is that really me? You know, but we do. We have this wonderful, and I call them my family members because they're all logical innovations. They're all part of our big family across the country. So uh, this pandemic is driving me nuts because I love to go see them and spend time with them. So, um, so, but, you know, just to have that opportunity to be across the country, to, to do the things I do, to, the, some of the things that I've experienced, the people I've met along the way. So that network, you know, it's your employees, it's your wonderful clients. I have some wonderful clients that have kept us going during this pandemic who through their um, through their um, preparations and, and being able to foresee what's going 
all of our folks continue to work during this pandemic and it's a different kind of environment, but we keep it going and, and keep the mission alive. And it's, it's just awesome to have that experience. Um, but also, you know, my business partners, um, I have a lot of business partners cause we can't do it alone. And so, you know, they're instrumental in our success and what we're doing. Um, and so one of my things too is now is like, I like to, you know, as, it, as the common theme here, you have to pay it forward. You have to be able to give back because someone took a risk with you and helped you along the way, whether it be your family, whether it be, you know, that company that just came out of nowhere and provided you with your first opportunity as a company. Um, so I believe in education. So one of the first things we did um, is establish um, scholarships. So the first scholarship we established was at College of the Mainland in Texas City. And we've had that in place since 2012. And now we have two scholarships there. Uh, a few years later in 2016 or so, we established our first um, endowed scholarship at the University of Houston Clear Lake. Um, so, and then we, um, we've established a second one that's ba based on um, STEM um, educators to be able to provide them with opportunities to to work and be paid as they're trying to have a little OJT. Um, and again, to get to get people that look like us in front of other students and encourage them to take, you know, um, take those steps for STEM careers. Um, we just established in December of 2020 um, an endowed scholarship in memory of um, a very important person to us as, um, as a company and, and personally um, a business partner. Um, but a memorial scholarship in his name at Prairie View A&M <coughs> University. Awesome. So, so you know, we're, we're just, you know, just that little bit every time, just trying to do that. Um, also, as a small business and as a growing small business, um, I feel very fortunate. So we look to mentor other small businesses. So we're actually an official mentor through the Small Business Administration um, to two small businesses, um, working with them as their mentor. Um, so... I had many mentors. I still have many mentors, but it's important that I, I, ooh, I, told me not to hit that. I serve as a mentor as well. Um, I, so I, I'm going to end it with just, you know, I would say, you know, our stories, they're far from over. They're always evolving. I mean, I, I think until they, until my last breath, I'm going to have another story to tell. Um, in fact, you know, I'm, I was so excited to come here today and now I'm like, I'm, I've got some new friends here. I'm going to make sure that they can mentor me. But, um, I, I had this really wonderful moment, um, May of 2019, and I was I was asked to be the commencement speaker at U of H Clear Lake for their graduation. And lo and behold, that first recipient of our Logical Innovations Hawk Advantage Scholarship at U of H Clear Lake was graduating. Oh, oh my goodness. Talk about this oh. moment where you kind of feel full circle. So as I'm telling my story and as I'm ending my story, I pointed her out. And bless her heart. She's a shy little girl. And I was like, yeah. I said, here is, you know, here is proof positive. You know, this is this is what this is what it's all about. To see, um, you know, something that you've worked for and something that has benefited someone else, and they're able to achieve their dream as well. So, um, you know, we we've, we've gotten awards and recognitions, and it's and it's wonderful. But, but, um, you know, to be that validation and to know that you've impacted someone else, um, I, I, you know. Don't get me wrong, I love our awards. We have wonderful customers. Our employees award us. We've been deemed as you know, one of the best and brightest across the country. Um, as you mentioned, NASA um, honored us as Small Business of the Year um, during the pandemic, in fact. And um, so you know, just all these wonderful blessings, but you, you just really have to pay it forward. And so I guess that's my message is to you know, never, never stop dreaming, believe in yourself. I mean, I'm going to echo everything, you know, these ladies said here, but it's also true. You know, we all have this kind of common thread um, here. So anyway, I just appreciate it. I think I've burned up my minutes, but <laughs> anyway, I thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, as we promised, I promised it and I delivered it, right? These amazing <laughs> stories. And I was thinking about this event last night and thinking about walking through bookstores um, and the business section. And you see all these biographies of business leaders. And notably, women's stories are often missing from those bookshelves. So I'm, I'm doing my shameless plug for these women to put this down on paper so that we can all read these stories. But you're lucky today because you got to be here and you get to hear it 
from their hearts um, right here for this wonderful event hosted by the East End Chamber of Commerce. So I don't know about you, but I have questions and I wish we could have questions from you come in because I know you probably have a million of them. So I'm going to act as your proxy today and try to answer and I will try to ask the questions that are burning in my mind. And I'm going to start with Paula. So Paula, you shared something so beautiful in your story. Um, it was really powerful. Just the fact that you sat down with your parents and you had to tell them, I am quitting this good job yeah. and I'm going to take this big leap and it is really scary. And they said, we support you. Mm -hmm. We often talk to people who are thinking about starting a business, but I want you to talk to the people around those people. The people that can sometimes be negative, can be discouraging, can be limiting. We can love somebody so much that we put a cage around them and don't let them be the fullness of who they can be. So I want you to talk to all of those family members that sometimes are less than supportive for that younger Paula. Yeah. Well, I think, thanks for the question. And, and I think that it's, you know, it's family members, it's even your friends, sometimes your best friends or people that you really think have your best interest at, at, at hand. But, you know, I ended my, my uh, 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 talk earlier and believe in yourself. And I think that's, that's number one. Now, did I truly believe in myself back then when I, I, I did. I did believe that I could do it. I did believe I could make a difference. But I think that one of the things that we need to do, and there's a big regret I have in business, uh, one in education, because it seems like we all have that common uh, thread of being educated and helping educate others is that, you know, Go out there and get educated. No one can take that from you. And I think that helps your self-esteem as well. It helps you understand, I can do this, listening to these stories. But we have to understand what we can do and what our capacity is, I think, within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And Denise, I mean, you were talking about it and saying how you planned it out. And, and then, you, Kelly, you were saying all the things that might go wrong, plan for that. This is the way I look at it. At the end of the day, if you have passion for what you want to do and ending up, the common theme here of helping others to providing jobs for people, that's one of the biggest things that I get out of owning companies is to, ha you know, having other people's lively, uh, livelihoods at stake, it's daunting sometimes. Mm -hmm. The young kids that you are mentoring in their business and that, it is daunting, but believe in yourself. Take some of that negativity. I still think that that's important. Take some of that negativity, but turn it to a positive. All right. They say, I'm going to fail, but I'll show them. Or they say, because of A, B, C, and D, I'll show them. Plan for that. Take that negativity, I think, Denise, is important, and figure out why they're saying those things, and then just turn it around and say, how am I going to make that a positive, and how am I going to make it work? And I think that's important. In our culture, Denise, you're talking about education. The, the young ladies in our, in our culture are not push to get educated, uh, to have their own companies, um, to leave the house before they get married. I mean, sadly enough, we're still there. We haven't really um, fixed that. But at the end of the day, knowing that we can do it, seeing others, like you said, in books or at the table here today, the chambers bringing us to light is saying, oh, I think I can do that. The other stuff, it's there, but just brush it off and say, Okay, I get it. Thank you for your comments and uh, come back one day and say, look what we've done. Look what we've accomplished. And I, it, it's not really in spite of what they said, but it's just saying I've over overcome those barriers as women, as minority women, and then just being at that corporate table. We've got what it takes. Take those comments and just turn them into a positive is what I say. I love it. We've mm -hmm. got what it takes. Mm -hmm. Kelly? And so, Denise, I, I want to echo some of the sentiments that Paula had about support and friends. I remember when we were, we were having dinner with some friends and we told them that we were starting a business and that our first project was in China. And they laughed. <laughs> <laughs> they literally laughed. And I was a little taken aback, but I understood that this was something different for, for them and something they didn't understand. And it wasn't their journey. So they weren't... Uh, they didn't have to understand. So we, 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 we just kind of like laughed it off with them and let them go or whatever. But then I was telling my mom that we were starting a business and that support is very important because I think that one of my comfort levels was that she, she didn't say don't. She was more or less, well, if you need anything, don't let your lights get turned off. <laughs> 
But it's to, if the kids need something, make sure you call me. So it was a matter of having that support because we're first generation entrepreneurs. And so it was definitely stepping into an unknown. And, that, and I think that had we seen it sooner in our life with, with our family and friends, we would have done it much earlier. And so that's where that importance of uh, being visible to your community, the people who look like you, and making sure that you share your honest truth with them. Not, oh, it's so good, yes, I'm making X amount of dollars or whatever, but actually really sharing the, the truth of uh, the behind the scenes, the backstory. And it gives other people the courage to do the same if that's where their uh, journey is taking them. And the other piece to that is, I don't know, I can't speak for everybody, but I was taught go to school, get a good education and get a job work for someone. And so that was my mindset early on. It wasn't until um, 13 years ago, because we started talking about it about three years before we actually did it. It wasn't until about 13 years ago that I started to say, you know what, we can do this. You can do project management. I can do the business side. We can do this. And so I just think it's important for us to make sure that we give back, that we bring somebody along, pull up a chair for the next woman that's uh, venturing into this industry. We don't have to be the only ones at the table. If we want to change that narrative, we have to be the catalyst. And so that's what I would encourage other women entering this business to do. Bring someone along with you and pull up a chair for them. Yeah. Love that. And Becky, you wanted to add to that? You know, your question also was, uh, what would you say to the people that spoke like your, like your family? And I have the same thing in the, in the Asian culture. You don't leave a job. <laughs> Not a good job. And, and when, I, when I went to Chick-fil-A, I was quitting a six-figure job to go to fast food. The horrors that my parents felt when I told them, it was just unimaginable. But I, I, and I honestly, I can't say that I had the kind of confidence that you did or that you ladies did, but there was something about the industry that just struck me that I wanted to go to it and I wanted that challenge. But what I've learned is that I mean, in starting new ventures, you're gonna fail, we're going to fail. And the, the most important thing I felt like was, is, and that maybe I could say to my family is, the encouragement that I would love for them to have given me was, okay, Beck, you're gonna fail, but when you fall, make sure you're falling forward. Don't fall back. Because even when you fail and you fall forward, you're still moving forward. And that's really important to learn as well. And, and just as you just said, Kelly, I think that bringing someone along behind you, you know, I think about my responsibility at Chick-fil-A. I'm not in the chicken business. They say, we say that we're not in the chicken business, we're in the people business. Mm -hmm. And so I love that because um, the responsibility is great for us that we need to find someone and we need to be intentionally opening our eyes to young women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because between just the natural societal overlooking that happens, not intentionally maybe, maybe intentionally, um, but I think in those moments, I think it's, it's on us to be watching for young people, especially young women, in this, as we're talking about in this panel, to be bringing alongside, to be intentionally developing them and to mentoring them and to find opportunities for them to grow as well. Yeah. So to, to whom much is given, much is required. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, I couldn't have said it better myself. And um, Denise, I actually wanna go, that gives me a, a good piggy bank to something that you said. Uh, it took you a lot of years to organize yourself and plan and to do this. And Kelly, you kind of alluded to this too, that it took you three years to kind of, to. do we talk ourselves out of our dreams? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that voice in our head that says, I don't know, you're not ready, you can't do it, wait, wait, wait. Can you talk a little bit about that time? And if you, ha if you could go back and talk to yourself in that first year, what would you have done differently? What would you say to that person? You know, I, I think... I exceeded my expectations. You know, I had it in my mind. I would worked for other companies, so I knew what, what their success looks like. But I had to define success for myself. What is success for me? So what, what is success for me is not the same for the next person. Um, and so one of those things is, um, you know, I talk about the network around you. Mm -hmm. And to I gather advice, but at the end of the day, it's up to me. I'm the ultimate one. I'm the one accountable. I'm the one who has the responsibilities. I'm the one, you know, I was going out on a limb because you know, I had family, I had a mortgage. I mean, I had people depending on me. And then I, someone had said, you know, when you have that first, that first employee outside of your family and you're going, 
okay, this is real. It just got real. Um, so if I were to go back and talk to myself back then, um, you know, I would just say, just listen to your inner voice, you know, just keep focused, take the advice of others. You know, one thing I learned, you know, we talk about failures along the way and those are key. Those are really key for us growing in our development. Um, but I, but I look at those and I, but I listen to the advice around me sometimes and say, okay, what happened? Did I not listen to something? Did I not read it right? Did, you know, did I, did I follow my gut too much? Did I follow that person that says, oh, I can do it? You know, uh, I don't care what they think, I can do it, but you gotta care what they think, especially the ones who are awarding the contract. Mm -hmm. So I, I think just making sure that while you follow your dream, you listen to yourself, you also know you're, you're aware of what the climate is, what those, those market trends, you know, what they're looking for. Um, I can tell you one of our biggest failures that, I don't call it failure, but um, was that we did everything right to go after a bid, after a contract, everything. We followed like, you know, just if there were a marketing and business pursuit 101, that we did everything to the letter. We got these wonderful reviews, but at the end of the day, we, weren't, we didn't even receive the contract award because we were perceived as too small of a business and we were trying to bite off more than we could chew. So I took that lesson and the next time I went to pursue it, another contract, and I got that same lesson. I got that same vibe that said, okay, they still, they're not taking me seriously. So I rebranded ourselves. I, I found a business partner and I said, okay, you and I are gonna join forces. We're gonna, we're gonna form a joint venture because now we're a bigger company. Mm -hmm. And so we repackaged ourselves. I went back out there to market and said, okay, I listened to what you said. Now here is the end result. And we won that contract. And so you've got to, you know, that's why I said, you're, you've got to go back. And so if I go back to my, you know, that person back then, you know, had heard of a joint venture, but never thought that was, you know, something that we were going to do. So it's just, you know, go back and say, take all those lessons and listen and make sure that you act accordingly. Yep. Yeah. Agree. I was going to make mention because I, I call them teaching moments <laughs> when we do something and we may not do it right or, we, you know, instead of failures, we call them teaching moments uh, back at the company. And I think they are teaching moments, right? And that's what you should do is you should learn from your mistakes or your failures. Um, but one of the things, you know, Denise, you're absolutely right. If you look at these major companies, they're hiring small businesses to do what they do every day. That's right. And they're not giving us as small businesses the contract, <laughs> but they're giving the big guy the contract and the big guys just turn around and going, oh, Denise, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you provide? So we're doing the work. And so I, I don't necessarily know that I would talk myself out of planning or planned a long time. I didn't. I planned I planned a good strategy for six months, which as small businesses, we know that's not near enough, uh, but that was some time ago. But I think that w what we need to do as we're planning, listening to those that are around you, but also don't change who you are. Mm -hmm. When I say believe yeah. in yourself, people are going to tell you, Denise, yeah, really, that's, I, I, I wouldn't do that. You need to do this or don't do this or don't look that way. Don't dress that way. Don't act that way. I think that's a lot of the character who you are that's bringing your passion and your drive to own a company. And so that's part of you. Take that and use it to the best of your ability. You know, I love the Chick-fil-A slogan, when you go there is, you know, my pleasure. It's, I, I just think that is just, <laughs> oh my gosh, how can you get youngsters to say that every time? I think it's key. But don't change who you are for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, I also say, be true to yourself, and research the things that you're standing for. Research the business that you're trying to get into so that you know what's important. But don't change because somebody else is telling you to change. And most of the time, it's going to be men that are trying to get you to change uh, in the business, who you are, what you're doing. Don't do that. Stay true to yourself um, and, and be firm about what you're going for. Mm -hmm. Such good That's advice. Good. And good. kind of building on that, um, Becky, I've got a question for you. Um, as one of only 10% of um, women that are mm -hmm. r franchisees for Chick-fil-A and the first Chinese American, um, what does a leader look like? I think a leader is a servant. Um, I think that's the best way that I teach my team members and my leaders how to be leaders is to, to learn how to serve others well. Um, our founder, Truett Cathy, he was like, this guy was, 
he was brilliant. He knew that the way to impact people to be influential was to be a servant. And um, I'm learning that every day. And I think to what Denise said, I think listening, uh, a, a leader is a, is a listener. Okay. Uh, I tell my kids at my store, leaders are readers. I think trying to read whatever you can get your hands on. And these days, podcasting, leaders are podcasters, right? We, we listen and watch podcasts. Whatever we can get ourselves on, we're lifelong learners. I think to be a great leader, I think you, we how do we study greatness? Well, we study people that are great. And so if you want to be a great leader, well, you're studying other leaders as well. What are they doing? What are they saying? Um, and the things that resonate with you inside are the things that apply to you. So every leadership principle out there may not apply to me, but there are things that I can hear. And, and so the beauty of having more podcasts, more books, more articles, um, more, more online classes that, that can help me grow as a leader, I think it gives me just a, I just cast a wider net because not everything will apply to me, but I'll find those, uh, those nuggets of gold, the nuggets, Thank you, chicken nuggets. Um, <laughs> those nuggets will—you're gonna—they're gonna—you're gonna know which ones apply to you. And and so the more that you just reach out through book, through reading, through listening, through watching, uh, through uh, receiving mentorship, uh, you'll receive the, uh, the 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 leadership principles that you need to apply to yourself. But just a lifelong learner. A leader's a lifelong learner and a servant. And, and leaders that. come in all shapes and sizes mm -hmm. and Absolutely. colors and genders, and there's not one way to be a leader. And Paul, you experienced that when you started your business of who is this woman telling us how to win construction deals? Like, what is that all about? <laughs> how did you overcome that? I tell you what, really quickly. Um, it was it was something because I, I know our culture and I know that there's machismo men, you know, in our culture that are, who do you think you are? I'm a construction person, and uh, so what I did was, is I, I'm not sure it was the best way to do it, but it, it worked. Um, I visited with him, and I was trying to work on his infrastructure of the company, not his actual core work, but telling him, you know, you don't have the right person in place if you do this, if you switch mm -hmm. around. And he was like, yeah, he just threw me to the curb. He said, who are you, a young Latina, going to help me with my construction company? And so what I did was is um, it just so happened that one of his competitors um, – was able to and wanted to use my services. And what I did was, is I went and I helped him do what I do best in his consulting um, business. And he won two contracts wow. that the other gentleman bid on. Wow. And I crossed paths with him and I, I, I wasn't, you know, snide about it or snickering. I just let him know that, did you know he's one of my clients? And his face just looked at me like, <laughs> Dang, I missed that bit. <laughs> but I think that also instilled in me that not every business is good business. He may not have been a good client to work for. And so although I was upset and I thought, yeah, I'm going to come back one day, it didn't happen just that way. But when it came back and I was able to show him, look, I did something for someone else that beat you out of a couple of contracts that I think you could have won. I think that instilled in him that maybe he should look differently upon a woman in business. But for me, it instilled not all good good business. Not all business is good business. And two, just go on to the next one. There mm -hmm. is plenty of business out mm -hmm. there to be gotten. Mm -hmm. And then also partnering. Denise mentioned that also is partner. There's enough business. Get a little bit of the pie. Everybody says, I want the whole pie. Get a little bit, and then get a little bit more, and then get a little bit more. And one day you have that whole pie. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's it. Is you just show your worth. I can do it. Make it happen. That's what I say. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you know, 100% of nothing is still nothing. Amen. That's right. So, yeah, that's right. No, but, but to your point of, you know, you know, we look around and we're in very male-dominated fields. Very much. I mean, you know, so, so, you know, there's always this thing about, well, you know, did you have to work harder? And I thought, you know what, I think we bring a lot of value. We bring a lot as women to the table. And so, like you said, you know, not all business is good business. You know, sometimes you have to know when to say, That's right. you know, I don't care what pile of money you have on the table. I'm going to walk away because my integrity is worth more right. than anything you could put on the table. And, and that's why I always tell, you know, I, I talk to like business classes um, and, and, talk, and they talk about entrepreneurship. So I'm, I'm like, I'm like one of the speakers for the, when the subject is entrepreneurship. And, and, and so my, I subtitled my, my, uh, my, story as a, so you want to be an entrepreneur. And again, you, you know, to be like really honest yeah. about, you know, you may see something, you go, wow, that's cool. But they're, you know, it's, it's like those ducks going along the pond. It looks so nice on the, 
on the surface, but underneath, you know, everything. So I said, there's a lot of this always going on. But, you know, to your point about partnerships, about, you know, making your ways, proving yourself, making your mark. And that's, and I mean, and your reputation will just precede you because yeah. it's, you know, it's all about, you know, building yourself and making sure, and, right. and people, you know, look at you and say, well, I'm not going to take a risk on you this time. But then they see someone else took a risk on you and were successful with you. And then that leads them to say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to put my stock behind them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's absolutely um, something you said in your presentation about working a full time job and going to school and taking care of a family. And like you just just committed to doing it really impacted me. This idea of a season of sacrifice. Right. That sometimes in building businesses, there's just a couple windows of time that are just tough. Um, and um, Kelly, you actually mentioned that as well of this of being you know, literally people talk about having a bi-coastal relationship. You had literally, <laughs> you know, halfway around the world relationship. Um, Ted, can you tell us a little bit about sacrifice? And Absolutely. the part that it plays in building a successful business. Absolutely. Well, that that's a very good question, Denise. There's a lot of sacrifice in building a successful business on many different fronts as well. When you say by, you know, he was he was in one country and I was in another country, I gained a whole new respect for single moms and single dads. Like that's a lot. That's a lot of uh, pressure to pressure to perform, pressure to be there for your children, for your husband, for your business. And it can take a toll on you. I'll tell you a quick story and then I'll get to your question. Is there was one point where he had to be there for three weeks. Mm. The longest we'd ever been apart was the two weeks. And so when it got to three weeks, uh, the third week, I just paid off my car. I had a Mercedes at the time. Paid off my car that morning, totaled it. <gasps> That afternoon, <laughs> you hear the gas <laughs> <in the crowd. laughs> totaled it that afternoon. Two days before, I picked up the kids from school, and so in my mind, my son was reciting something that he had to do at school. So I was like, "Okay, we'll get the recitation out of the way. That's part of the um, that's part of getting homework done." And I thought I was out of the school zone, but I wasn't. Still wasn't speeding, but got a ticket. So I literally realized at that point, I'm unraveling. I got to take a step back. And so I, you know, I called my husband. I love my, I just wrecked my car. And I told him, he's like, are you okay? Yes. Okay, don't worry about it. The, you know, and so it kind of calms you down. But yeah, there are points where you literally sacrifice. You feel like, you can feel like you're sacrificing mm -hmm. everything. Right now, we're going through a high growth season. And that's sacrificial because we're sacrificing time with each other, sacrificing time with our kids, and, and we're in a pandemic. But literally, we're spending 12 to 13 hours on the phone with our, with our, with our teaming partners. Again, JVs, we have a couple of joint ventures that you know, we've entered into to, to win contracts. And so it's just, it's one of those things where you have to be clear about what you're willing to sacrifice. And for me going into this, I was never willing to sacrifice my family or my time with my family. Luckily for me, my kids have grown up in the business with us, and so they understand and appreciate it. So when we travel to China, we still have those same, we, we've had those same clients now for about seven years. Mm -hmm. And so when we travel to China, we take them with us. And when we're going to meetings or when we're going to uh, events around the city, we take them with us. So there's, there's great sacrifice. Um, we were going to buy a new home and we had to we had to make a decision. Do we buy a home right now or do, do we save this money, set it aside and make sure we have it for the business in case we need it because we we're growing. And so what was supposed to be we sold the home we were in, what was supposed to be two to three years and then we get another turn into seven. And so it's just about understanding where your values are. And it and and now it works out because we're getting more house than we would have gotten at that time. But that was never even the thought. The thought was, this is what we've committed ourselves to. This is the legacy we want to leave for our children. This is how we provide for other families, the people who work for us. Someone said earlier uh, in the discussion that when you get your first employee, it becomes real. 
<laughs> and it does. When the yeah. pandemic hit, our first thought was, well, we got to make sure that we're still taking care of these families. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so you, you and, and literally my uh, discussion with my CFO was, if you have to not pay Troy or me, do that. But we don't want to have to lay anyone off if we don't have to. And luckily for us, we have not had to. So, you know, you just have to make sure you understand what your non-negotiables are and stick yeah. to them. Because what makes you special is who you are, your core values and what you bring to the table. And I'll add one last thing. I think that the... Um, the success of our company has been that we do partner with larger companies, but we also bring that level of talent to the table as well. Yeah. So we don't go out and hire uh, someone just because maybe their salary is less. No, if, you, if we are at the airport and we're working on a $2 billion project, we're gonna present them with talent that has worked in that industry for 20 years and worked on $10 billion projects. Mm -hmm. And so what our, what our clients have realized is that we're a smaller organization, but they're getting the same talent, That's they're right. getting the yes. same care mm -hmm. totally. that they would get with a larger prime, and we don't have the overhead that the prime have, has. And so that, that has really worked in our favor. Mm. I love that. So it's like an abundance mindset. Yes. Making oh, yeah. you don't have to scrimp on a million things to kind of make as much money as you possibly can, and you can do a JV and get a percentage of the mm -hmm. deal because that's going to help you grow. It's a, it's believing in abundance, not an all or none, zero sum gain. Exactly. Love and that. One last thing you, mm -hmm. you said something Denise that really uh, it is you get a piece of it. But I do want to encourage small businesses, make sure that you're getting a, a, a piece that makes sense. Yep. You don't want to say, so okay, good. yes, I'll take 2% if Absolutely. you noted that you should really get 7, 11, 20, whatever. So don't just take a small piece. You do have to still know your value That's right. because your value is perceived value as well. So if, if, right. if you go in and say, I want 1%, then the client automatically know, the, knows, okay, you don't really believe in yourself as much. You know, you'll accept that. And so you still have to know what you can operate off and mm -hmm. stick to that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good. Such, I mean, so many good, uh, it's just so much good advice. I don't even know where to stop and start. <laughs> um, there's, there's a commonality among three of you in that you were working in the industry in some capacity, or in your case, Troy was working in the industry in some capacity before you moved into launching this business. Mm -hmm. But Becky, that's not true for you because you literally were like working at your finance job, working with the money, working, doing your thing and said, you know, I'm gonna go into the restaurant business. So can you talk to us a little bit about that big leap, the learning curve, your, um, your thoughts and your processes as you investigated this new venture and just um, how did you find the courage to do something totally brand new? You know, I feel like as a child, um, my growing up years were, uh, I had the opportunity to experience a lot of service and hospitality, church dinners, family dinners. My mom would cook for large groups and just to see people so happy about food. I mean, there's just something about <laughs> gathering around food that always intrigued me. And even as a young adult, I felt like I wanted to be a business owner, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but the thought of food service was always intriguing to me. And when, and, and again, I felt like the jobs that I had in one sense, as, as kind of a young adult, I felt like, okay, I felt like I'm going nowhere. Right. I mean, these jobs that I was so fortunate that they were good paying jobs. They were great. I had benefits. And and that was predominantly why my parents didn't want me to quit these jobs. It's like, but you have good benefits because that's the ancient <laughs> way. Right. You have benefits. And yeah. so the the leap for me was the opportunity presented itself just wildly, almost out of the blue. And, and that's why I say it was a, it was a divine uh, it was a divine encounter that opened the door. And and I, and as a person of faith, I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer in incorporating faith into my work. Mm -hmm. And, and not, maybe not overtly, but I believe it's there. And so when the opportunity presented itself, it was just, it just came at me like a wave. And I thought this just was so random, right? That's what we think it is, mm -hmm. that it was so random that I thought I couldn't not walk through the door. And so the I think it was probably better for me 
than my colleagues here who <clears throat> had opportunity to make the choice to make the jump in that way into an area they wanted to go into. For me, I think that if I would have, to go back into an old question you asked, Denise, if I would have thought about it and planned for it and created my my career plan from that point, I would have talked myself out of it. I would have stayed in my safe job. I would have had my great benefits. Um, I would have stayed six figures. But it was, but as a, as a person who started kind of older in this journey um, and being single as I am, a single older woman, that I felt like this was my chance to live a dream. And it was a dream to be in the food service industry. So, that's cool. I love that. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> There's so many things to unpack there. Um, you know, the, the, the courage to try something new and to learn. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a theme I've heard from all of you today, this idea of being a lifelong learner. You know, my goodness, China, learning mm -hmm. all about, I mean, just, <laughs> lear just yes. learning, learning about JVs, learning about how to structure deals, learning about how to bulk yourself up. And so you present yourself as a as a viable contender for um, um, uh, opportunities like there's so much learning. Um, that you've talked about. And I guess I want my next question, and, uh, and I'll start with you, um, Paula. Um, how did you learn to be a leader? I, I don't, I just don't think you learn to be a leader. I, I'm very blessed that I might be considered a leader in, in our community, in our business, but I think it just comes from your core values, yeah. your core beliefs what you think is important. So everybody thinks because you own a very successful business, you're just rich. You're just rich. You've got <laughs> money that just, just flows out of the bank, right? Um, but doing the right thing and giving back and you know helping your employees and doing things, that I think comes with being a leader. I think looking at the employees that, if you look at it, they're making money for me as a business owner. So it's, it's just the right thing to do is to take care of them. I think that's important. What we're doing in the endowed scholarships and giving back, that's key because we're bringing along. So leaders surround themselves, I think, with those that are better than them, that are smarter than them, that, have, that bring different things to the table. So I think that's why mentors for me are so key is because we don't know it all. And going into our businesses, whether it's construction, I'm now in, you know, selling research supplies and equipments. I'm not a scientist. I did not take do well in biology. Uh, forget chemistry. So, you know, where that happened. Um, so what I'm doing, though, is I'm providing a project management service. So I bring those along that with me that know the business, that know what they're doing. I'm selling a value. I'm selling who we are as a company, customer service. So I don't know that you learn to be a leader. I think it's I guess for me, like she said, it's it's being a servant to those around us and what we're doing. If I make money along the way, I think that's great. My initial, what I thought about when I owned a company, what was my first goal? And mine was to be able to financially take care of my parents. Mm -hmm. And I am so proud that I got to do that. I don't have them with me anymore, but I'm so proud of that. And then the second was to be able to provide for my family. I mean, I've got a great husband, 30, almost 35 years, and have a great marriage, but at the end of the day, that's something I have been able to do, obviously with his support, with my family support. So I don't know if it's something you learn. I think it's something that's in you, but that you choose to bring those around you to help you be that person, to help you take that journey along the way, whether it's to China <laughs> or, or you know, uh, across the country. You know. But I think that that's what it is. It's who you are, your core values, and what you do with them mm -hmm. that makes, I think, that's you right. a leader if that's what it's considered. That's right. I think that's so beautiful because I think that one of the challenges we have of having more women in leadership, quite frankly, is people think that leadership looks a certain way and it has to be, you have to be born into it and you have to be so tall and charismatic and, you know, and, and it's like, well, no, we all have leadership within us. That's right. We all have the capacity to leverage the gifts that we've been given mm -hmm. to lead other people to achieve an objective. Um, Becky, did you want to add to that? I, you know, I, this is what I love about my company. I'll talk about my company all day if you let me, but you know, our, our, our purpose statement is to be, to have a positive impact. You know, in our case, it's to have a positive impact on who comes in, 
in contact with Chick-fil-A, but just in general, I think the purpose statement applies to our kids. And I tell them, you can be impactful, you can be influential in whatever capacity you're in. When you're, when you're in junior high school, you can still be impactful. Um, and even when my team members are just, they say, well, I'm just a team member, I'm not a leader. And I said, no, a leader is not what shirt you wear. A leader is the character and the traits and the behaviors that you bring. And so to, to really, the, the beauty of my job is I get to say it every day to my young people, is, is every, you have an opportunity every day to make an impact. And everyone has a leadership potential in them. Everybody does. Everybody does. Mm -hmm. Everybody does. Um, uh, Denise, when we were talking, you were talking earlier, you mentioned in your amazing story that um, your employer was your first customer. Awesome. And to me, that speaks directly to what Becky is talking about, this idea that you can lead from the middle. You can lead from the bottom. You can lead, and, and that, the, the, the giftedness that they saw in you is what gave them the confidence to say, we'll be your first That's customer. Right. That's right. Can you talk a little bit about that level of relationship building, mm. building those relationships that's up, good. right? Because that's that's what we're talking about is how do you build those kinds of relationships, that kind of trust, that kind of investment um, that makes somebody will be willing to take a risk on you? Yeah. That's good. You know, it, it goes back to, you know, I, I always say I have this like this list of I call them the, the, the P's, you know, plan, persistence, perseverance. But for, but I say the bottom line, perform. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that's what makes people want to invest in you, want to take that chance with you because they, your track record, they want to see that you're going to perform. You're not, you know, you're not just going to, you know, fizzle in the pan. You know, you really do have that passion, that motivation. You're going to do something with it. And, and so I think, you know, you build on that and you build on that to make it into your story and people want to get on board with you because they were, you know, they want to go, well, wait a minute, I want to be part of that story because this is, you know, this is cool. I want to have my name attached to that. And so I think that's where you, you build that trust, you know, and, and it is all about trust. Um, and I always tell people they, like, I, you know, I have trust issues. So I'm real picky about the partners and, that I bring to the table and the people that I work with, because I have to know that when we're not, when we're apart, they're still, um, you know, portraying those same values. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, right. you know, it's like, hey, your business partner's over here and they went, you know, and I don't want, you know, I, you know, we worked really hard to, to make a, a really good reputation for ourselves. And so it's just building that trust. Um, and like I said, that, and that company, you know, the funny thing about it is I, I had worked for other companies locally and this company just came out of the blue and um, I'd gotten to know them because they were part of my network. <clears throat> but they recognized something in me, you know, for someone who had just known me for a short period of time. So, you know, we talk about our network and we talk about people who have been with us a long time and we have a lot of naysayers sometimes. And in that network, you know, you're building this garden, you're growing this garden. And sometimes you're going to have to recognize that there's going to be weeds there that you're just going <laughs> to have to pull, <laughs> to pull out. And some of them, you know, and you think, you know, those are people that should have been like, on your bandwagon the whole time, and they're not. But sometimes you have to have, make those hard decisions to say, "I've got to, I've got to clear out my garden of those bad weeds," yep. um, and just you know make sure that you surround yourselves with the right people, and then they'll put you forward, and then you've got to pay it forward. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about with leadership, and you know, I, I think it's also important that we're role models um, because when we're paying it forward, you know, we're all talking about family, um, and I'm very fortunate that I'm a grandmother of three beautiful grandchildren. And it's important that I project this image that they're proud to see because this is part, I'm trying to build a legacy for them. Right. So we talk about taking care of our families yeah. and they're, you know, I want them to know that there's, there's something to, to, you know, move forward. And, you know, I, I, my three grandchildren, two of them are girls, so they're watching. I mean, I have one who tells me sometimes like, hey, Momo, I Googled you and I didn't know. <laughs> and it's like, oh my gosh, you're That's Googling cute. me. <laughs> so awesome. she learns That's things cute. off, but yeah. yeah. Um, so I was like, let me, I better check, make sure there's good stuff out there. <laughs> yeah. That's so, a good goal to be Googleable. To be Googleable, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> to have your grandchildren go, oh, wow, that's cool. I didn't right. know you did that. 
So I love it. I yeah, love it. Um, Paula, you want to add to that? I do. I want to talk about networking just for a minute because I've mentioned it a couple times in relationships. And, you know, we're here because of the East End Chamber. I mean, we're all members and we have a great leader in Francis that brings us together. But I want to just also mention, because I think everybody's going to nod their heads yes about relationships. And I try to, when I talk to young adults, tell them, do not burn bridges. That's you know, right. You're not going to like right. everybody <laughs> right. that you meet. You're not going to have a good relationship with them, whether it's work, a boss, I mean, you name it. So I, I, I want to make that kind of from a business perspective very clear at how important relationships have been in my life. So early on when I was with Corporate America, I was given, you know, afforded the opportunity to go to the chamber events and go to lunches and breakfast. You know, now I have a lot of youngsters in my company that I try to nurture and, and, and do well by. And, you know, they say, oh, well, you're always at a breakfast and you're always at a lunch and you're going to these galas and things. And I tell them, guys, yes, I do, but that's work. That's where you're establishing, <laughs> yes. you know, understanding who this person is. And, and to make a point about our 20 year anniversary, I can tell you right now, my bank, my, I'm sorry, my CPA, I met at the Chamber of Commerce and she's been my CPA for 20 years and knows my business. My attorney, my now, we've been very fortunate to give back to our employees. We have an employee profit sharing plan. And who's managing that portfolio for me? a chamber person that I met 25 years ago, but because we've done things together in the community, we've given back together, we volunteer together, I trust him. I trust That's him right. with this hard-earned money that we've made because we don't always invest and are not taught to do that. And I told him, Patrick, I said, you better take care of my money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But relationships go back and it's, it's so key that we wouldn't be here like we said, without Absolutely. mentors and those supporting us in relationships. So the chamber does a great deal of putting that networking opportunity for us. Don't just think it's a luncheon or a breakfast. That's right. Who are you going to mm -hmm. meet? Talk to people around you. Who knows? You know, her and I may be doing business together, you know, someday. Um, but it, I, I just think that that is so key for our younger generation to know and those that are aspiring to be uh, entrepreneurs in businesses. Don't burn your bridges and just soak in every relationship you can and keep that Rolodex, if you will, up to date. <laughs> oh my gosh. People my are daughter, daughter, Rolodex. <laughs> my daughter, she just yelled at me because I said Rolodex. Oh my God. And I was like, I feel judged. I feel, this is ageist. Hey, like, we know what we're talking about. Stop saying Rolodex. I was like, okay, we know what bye, we're talking bye, about. Bye. Get your iPhone out. There you go. There you but, go. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and such an incredible, incredible point, right? People are watching. They see what you're doing. They see your performance. They see what you bring to the table. Um, and they see you at gatherings and events, and they get interested in you and want to develop a relationship. But, um, Kelly, something you mentioned earlier um, is that people look at you sometimes and they think it looks easy, right? Um, Denise, you shared the, the image of the duck, you know, furiously flapping uh, uh, underneath, yeah. paddling in, under the water. Um, there's somebody watching this conversation right now that says, oh, they're so amazing. They've accomplished so much. I could never do that. That could never be me. Kelly, what words do you have to that young woman that's listening right now that says, I came from this background, or I'm this race, or I'm this gender, or I, I was educated in this way. Like, that could never be me. What words do you have for her? At the top of this discussion, I said, I believe there's a God who has my interests at mm -hmm. the top of his mind. That's right that same God or whatever God you serve has your interest at mind. Prepare, learn, be open-minded, grow and be great. That's it. That's awesome, period. That's, that's really <laughs> the formula. You will fail. It's okay, it's not the end of the world. You learn, you grow, you get up, you dust yourself off and you keep going and you be available for someone else that's gonna be critical for your growth because your blessings are never for you and you alone. Sure. And so you have to be open and willing to share that. And I promise you, once you do that, your gift will open unique opportunities specifically designed for you. And so don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. And that's what I would have told younger Kelly. Don't overthink it, just do it. Just Amen. do it. <laughs> I don't know that I could say it any better. I don't know what else could we add to that, 
right? This has been such an incredible, incredible conversation. We've talked about the season of sacrifice. We've talked about failure. We've talked about courage. We've talked about relationships. We've talked about navigating male-dominated spaces and carving out your space and your niche. Sometimes moving away from people who don't believe in you mm -hmm. and finding the ones that will. Mm -hmm. We just had such a rich, rich conversation. And um, I'm sure if you are listening to this conversation, you hopefully have pages and pages of notes like I do right here. And, I, and again, like I said at the top of this conversation, it does not matter how many great people you listen to, how many great podcasts you listen to or books you read or any of those things, if you don't commit to applying the principles. Right. And these wonderful ladies have given you tons tons to listen to and to apply to your life today. We wish you so much luck in being the best possible you that you can be. And I will kick it over back to Francis. Thank you, Denise, so much. You and the panelists were amazing today. I would like to thank you and close with a quote from Maya Angelou. I would like to be known as an intelligent woman, a courageous woman, a loving woman, a woman who teaches by being, and that is what each of the women here today did for me. They inspired me. They motivated me. They're business women who know, knew what they wanted to do, who worked very hard and achieved those dreams. So thank you all very much. I also wanted to give thanks and also show you the flower arrangements that we had donated today by Sharonda Scroggins from KC Events and Floral. Remember, if you want to order yourself a bouquet of flowers, please support a women-owned business like KC Events and Floral. Again, if you want to be a member of the chamber, my contact information is on our website. Please reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you more about this. It's all about connection. It's all about networking so we can continue to bring programming like today. We wish you a wonderful day. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next year for our East End Women in Business. Bye-bye.